preacher's favorite. Probably comes up every two or three years in the cycle. So those of you who've been in the church a long time, I wouldn't be surprised if you've heard this sermon so many times, five, 10, 15, maybe more. So we all know the story, don't we? A man comes to Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him a story. A story about a man who was beaten, robbed, and left for dead. The question is, what does it mean today for us? Now, traditionally, in the church, there have been two ways to interpret this parable, two ways of understanding. The first is called the allegorical method. If you remember high school English, an allegory, everything stands for something else. Well, for 1,500 years, this is how scripture was understood. They believed that all of scripture was allegorical and the church would interpret it. So in the interpretation, the man represents Adam, all of us. We're all on a journey. We're all going down this path of life. And then something happens at some point or another, whether we're beaten, robbed, and stripped, and left for dead, or disillusioned, hurt, broken. But what happens to us? How are we put back together? The robbers in the allegorical method are the demons, the devils, the difficulties of life that make it so hard for us. The priest is the law. And the Levite represents tradition. Those are the two pillars of the church in those days, of Judaism. But the point is, neither the law nor tradition can help us, can put us back together. And then a Samaritan comes, who represents Christ. In this case, the outsider. The man's wounds are his disobedience. The inn, which accepts all who enter, is the church. And the fact that the Good Samaritan promises to return echoes the promise that Jesus made, I will return, I will not leave you alone. So that's the story that was interpreted for us. We are all wounded by sin. The law cannot save us, our tradition cannot save us, only Christ can bind up our wounds, can save us. Christ who even now prays for us, and commends us to the church who administers the grace of God to the world. Well, there came, as you might imagine, in time, a pushback to that interpretation. The pushback came with what was called a reformation of the church, in which people said two problems with this. Number one, Jesus does not need a broker. We don't need the church to administer Christ to us. God's grace is through Christ, not through the church. And so we have this direct relationship with Christ. Number two, not all of scripture is allegorical. Some may be, but some scripture, most of scripture, is just plain sense. It says what it says. And so there was this push to translate scripture into the common language, give scripture to the people. It was no longer the church who told people what it meant, no longer was it in Latin, so most everybody had no clue what it meant without the church interpreting. Now the book was given to us for our use, for us to read and to understand the plain sense of scripture. So in this interpretation of scripture, rather than Christ through the church who mediates grace to us, plain sense was to answer the question, who is my neighbor? That's what this story is about. And the answer to who is my neighbor, your neighbor is the person who needs you. Person may be living in the condo next door to you, broke their hip, need some help going to get the groceries. The neighbor may be someone down the street. The neighbor may be a child far, far away. The neighbor is a person who needs us without regard to their color, to their gender, to their language, to their birth origin. So that became our understanding 
of what it means to be a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan is to respond to others to be right with God. As the Gospel of John says, God is love, and when you abide in love, you abide in God. When you reach out and minister to others, even to the least of them, you do Christ's work. You are living the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the tradition of the church, two understandings, allegorical, common sense. Those lasted for a long time. But I'm wondering if we are not neglecting another understanding, and I'll explain. Lately, and I say lately, I've been retired, so there hasn't been much lately, to tell you the truth, but before I retired, the last several years, I began to understand how important art and pictures were. The screens that you lose, use in worship, they're kind of like the modern day stained glass windows. You know, back in the day, people walked in the church and it was the windows that told them the story and the artwork in the church. So I looked for a piece of art that might tell this story. And this is the painting by Rembrandt. Now, this is only a small section of the painting. It's a, it's a much larger painting. It was painted in 1633. And the painting has some problems with it. That's why we took just a small part of it. In this small part, you see the Good Samaritan put the man on his horse, his animal, in this case it's a horse, and is taking him to the inn. But as I said, the painting is 500 years old, it's very dark, and that's why I've not shown you the entire painting. It has some problems. It was painted on wood for one thing. The Nazis stole it during the war. It got battered, and it's in a museum in Krakow, and frankly, I don't think they've had the money to restore it properly and to lighten it. So I thought, okay, I need another painting by somebody else to, to illustrate this. But before I show you the painting, I want to tell you a little bit about his life. His name is Vincent van Gogh, and probably everybody has heard of Vincent van Gogh. What most of us don't know is Vincent van Gogh's story. He was born into an upper middle class family. He was born with privilege. His grandfather was one of the leading art critics in all of Europe, very scholarly, his father himself was an artist, but a pastor of a church. And so Van Gogh grew up in the church. But early on in Van Gogh's life, he understood that he was wrestling with something that was unlike anybody else he knew was wrestling. And that was, he had these tremendous mood swings. There would have been times when he was manic, when he just had all the energy, couldn't sleep, and then there were times when he was so depressed, he could hardly get out of bed. And this was as a teenager. And then his behavior at times was bizarre. So Van Gogh, people didn't understand what was happening to him. They just thought he was crazy. So he threw himself into the church. He became a hyper-Christian. He went to seminary. Then he became a missionary to South Belgium to work with the coal miners. And when he was a missionary, he outdid John the Baptist. If we think John the Baptist lived at the edge, Van Gogh deprived himself of food, of good shelter, of everything, because he wanted to live so plainly that his life would be acceptable. But the mood swings continued. Now, here's a picture of the young Van Gogh. You can see this is a guy with life's in front of him. I mean, he's well-dressed. His family has given him everything, and yet... His mental health continues to deteriorate. And then it was that he no longer could work in the church because of his behavior, his, his extreme oddities. And in one maniacal episode, he tried to cut off his ear, as this painting shows. And you probably have all seen this painting at one time or another. Notice that his ear is bandaged. So many of us know pits and pieces of the story. But to give you a frame of reference, this is the 1880s, which is what? 
40, 50 years ago? 40 years ago? No, it's longer than that. You're listening. But if we didn't understand mental health today, if we're still struggling with mental health, imagine what it was like 140 years ago. People just ostracized people with mental health. They wouldn't talk to them. They would shun them. And so Van Gogh committed himself to an insane asylum. And the last nine years of his life, he lived in that asylum. And now he turned himself to his first love. He turned them back into art. And there became this prodigious flurry of activity. In the last nine years of his life, he painted 860 paintings, many of which you would recognize. Of those 860 paintings, do you know how many were sold? None because nobody would buy a painting of a madman. Nobody wanted a painting in their house of somebody who was crazy. Yeah, you can go talk to your great-great-grandparents why they didn't buy a couple, you know, because you could have bought a penny on the dollar and put it away. But nobody would touch it. Everybody abandoned him except for his brother Theo, and his brother Theo was probably the only thread he had to any sanity at all. Now, it's during this time when he is painting and he's struggling with his mental health. And he knows that he's a child of God. He knows that he is loved by God. And one of the things he used to do is reflect on Rembrandt's painting, the painting that I showed you earlier. But now Van Gogh decided he would paint his own painting of the Good Samaritan. And this is where I made a discovery when I looked at this painting. Here's his painting. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but if you look very, very closely, look at the ear of the Good Samaritan. Can you see it? It's bandaged, just like Van Gogh's ear was bandaged. In other words, as Van Gogh is painting the Good Samaritan, he is identifying with the Good Samaritan. He says, you know, I know what that's like. I know what it's like to be thrown aside, to be thrown in the ditch, and everybody walks by me. Nobody wants to touch me. Nobody wants to speak to me. Nobody wants to become contaminated by me. I am there in that ditch, and the only one who is there for me, I feel, is Christ. So I want to share yet another interpretation of this scripture. Because I think we identify with the Good Samaritan. We believe, and it's true, it's correct, it is our responsibility to help others. It's our responsibility to give, to give back. God has blessed us, and we are to be a blessing to others. So we identify with the Good Samaritan. In part, when we take a casserole to somebody that's just had a tragedy in their life, we take a casserole, there's a sense of doing something, because you feel so helpless. But when you can take a casserole, you feel, at least I've done something. I've shown them that I care. What I want to suggest to you, it is also a gift to receive that casserole. It is also important for us to understand there are times when we need somebody to come to our house to say a good word, to give us a casserole. The difference between us and the person in the ditch is a difference in degree, not kind. Now, let me explain that. I believe that the difference between our lives and those who have much less or are hurting much more than we are is not a difference in kind because we're all one. It's simply a degree. And that at one time or another, we've been in that ditch, or we will be in that ditch. And I believe that part of the power of this Good Samaritan is in Van Gogh saying, wait a minute, I'm in the ditch, I'm in the ditch, and I understand the power of grace because it's the only thing, the only thing that is keeping me alive. We've all been wounded. We've all been hurt. We've all been disappointed. For some, 
It was a divorce. For others, our boundaries were violated. Perhaps our boundaries were violated when we were children, when we were so helpless, and it still affects us to this day. For some, we are wounded by love and wounded by loss. To love, eventually, is to lose. And those of you who have buried a spouse, those of you who have buried a child know that that is a wound from which you are never fully healed. And of course, people come and they reach out to us. They do the best they can, but they're helpless. They can't take it away because loss is unique. Again, the difference between us and Van Gogh and the person in the ditch it's just a matter of degree. Part of our loss, I think, is that we are being robbed. My mother used to say, youth is wasted on the young. I had no clue what she meant. <laughs> no clue what she meant. But as you get older, you begin to understand. You play golf three days a week instead of six days a week. You... Uh, Perhaps your vision goes, your hearing, your balance, the ability to live independently, until slowly, it's almost as though you can see the tread on your life wearing down. And sometimes for some people it wears down and they have no desire to keep on living. We've all been wounded. I think something else that wounds us today that has hit us like a tsunami is that we are wounded by the actual and by the fear of losing our memory. You know, it's one thing when you're 30 years old and you walk out to the car to get something and you get to the car and you have no idea what you went out to the car to get. And you start laughing at yourself. So I believe this. I went out to the car to get something. What did, I, what did I go out there for? And you laugh, and maybe you tell your spouse, yeah, it was crazy. But when it happens to you when you're 80, you don't laugh. Because we all know people who've gone through it. We all know people who lost not just a momentary memory loss, but for whom dementia, Alzheimer's is so real, so powerful, that we just shudder and say, uh-oh, uh-oh. We've all been wounded, folks. We've also been wounded not only by what's happened to us, but sometimes what we've done to others, even if it was unintentional. We know that we have done something that has wounded someone else, and it sits there in our soul in the back burner and just, just kind of eats away. So this morning, if you were expecting me to tell you that the story about the Good Samaritan is you are to bump your pledge to the church because we're all supposed to give back. I mean, go ahead and do that. The, <laughs> the stewardship committee will love you. No, this morning I want to remind you that we've all been on the other side, or we will be on the other side, and the power of the gospel. So what happens to the fellow in the ditch? Christ comes, lifts him up, and takes him where to the innkeeper. And then the question really turns, who is the innkeeper? Now, you may not be ready for this, but you are the innkeeper. Because if you have ever affirmed your baptismal vow, you have made a promise, a vow to God to be there for others, to give back. You are the person, where the broken, the weary, 
the people who are grieving, the people who just buried a spouse, the people whose child has gone AWOL. You are the people where somebody can come, not to receive judgment, not to hear, I told you so, but simply to say, I'm your brokenhearted sister, I'm here for you. We are the innkeepers. We have taken this oath, and that's the good news. We are not left in the ditch. We are loved, and that love continues through others. For those who live the gospel, who are willing to be there for others. So that is the story of the Good Samaritan. Yes, we are called to be there for others. But yes, others will be there for us. And when we allow them to bring that casserole to us, we are also giving them a gift, and our healing is happening. And now, unto Christ be the power, the glory, and the dominion. Amen. We stand with me as we sing our final hymn. How clear is our vocation, Lord.